Silicon Valley venture capitalist and billionaire Charmath Palavhapi Pia, who was an early executive at Facebook, has spoken about the impact of screen time on his own child and detailed how he resisted calls to medicate this child, instead taking away screen time with dramatic results. One of my kids, and I'm not going to say who it is, we recently had them tested for ADHD. They weren't doing particularly great in school. The response by some of the folks in the school was, oh, there's meds for that. We're like, no meds. And what we did was we took away their iPad and we completely deprived them of all these apps and video games. I cannot describe to you the magnitude of the turnaround in this kid. Hmm. Grades, incredible, where they were getting 60% and 70%, now getting 90%. Totally engaged, interesting, charming kid that had lost a little bit. And I think that there was a little bit of a daze. And this is a known fact, actually, Jamath. I looked into this as well. It turns out students who used iPads and digital media many times a day, they show the exact signs of ADHD, inattention and hyperactivity uh, and impulsivity. So zero, not like you can have a little bit here or there, zero. And the transformation in this last month and a half, two months has been incredible. I don't know if other parents are dealing with this, but what I'll tell you is these apps are not good. Psychologist Claire Rowe joins me now. Claire, this is fairly a uh, profound testimony from a father and tech expert. What's your professional opinion about ADHD symptoms and the amount of time kids are spending on screens? Okay, so beyond a doubt, there is research coming out, and, that, and this is the thing, it's completely emerging. So we're going to know the answer to this in 10 years' time. Could be too late for a generation. But there is research coming out showing that kids who have excessive screen time compared to their peers are twice as likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. Now, what our viewers may not realise is a couple of things about ADHD. Uh, one, we don't have a test for it. OK, there is no test for ADHD. Mm. We don't have a brain scan or a blood test or something. It's based on self-report of symptoms. And the second thing is we don't actually know for sure how ADHD is caused. And in fact, we know that we may have been concentrating too heavily on genetics uh, in the past. And we know that it's far more of an interplay between genetic vulnerability and your environment. So I absolutely think this happens. I think, you know, is there a new subset or form of ADHD? Kids on screens are displaying ADHD symptoms. And I think that's because they live in this world, and, and even as adults we know, right, where there is excessive kind of stimulation and we're switching screens and it's there's a lot going on. On. Um, and then we come into the real world, which perhaps is a little bit of a slower pace and a little bit boring, and there's a little bit of irritation and inattention. So absolutely, I, I think, I mean, I've said it before, this is just another reason, the uh, negative impact on screens, particularly on primary school age children, far outweighs any positives if there are positives. And I think we're kidding ourselves if we're saying, oh, there's educational positives and we've got to you know, teach them to be digital natives. I just... I don't buy that argument at all. I think in the future we will look back and think we, we were just sitting six and seven-year-olds on iPads and it's destroying their brains. Now, more information is coming out about Joel Couchy, the 40-year-old Queensland man who carried out the horrific Bondi Junction attack over the weekend, killing six people. He was known to Queensland and New South Wales police for mental health-related matters. They say his attack on Saturday had no links to any religion or uh, political ideology. Joel's parents have said he was diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was 17. He'd been medicated but came off it recently because he said he was feeling better. Uh, Claire, this case has sparked new discussions about the state of mental health care in this country. What are the resources that are available for people with schizophrenia and are they readily available uh, for people who want treatment and are they affordable? Yeah, so they are readily available. We've got, like many other things, uh, two options, being the public system or private. And obviously, if you go into private care, 
whether that be inpatient or outpatient, it can be very costly for those that can afford it. But there is there is uh, patient care for those with psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia in the public system. Um, again, you know, that involves things like cons consults with a psychiatrist, uh, pharmacological medication, um, as, long, as well as psychological interventions. So that is available in the public system. I think I think the question here is more to say being mentally unwell, having a psychiatric disorder is not illegal. And unless you are scheduled under the Mental Health Act, of which there is several reasons that you can schedule someone, that is hold them against their will uh, and treat them, uh, um, namely they have made threats against other people's lives or their own, um, but unless unless they do that, and unless you can hold them against their will, you can't force someone into treatment. And that is, you know, a mm. human right. And that that is a whole ethical question in itself. If you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, should we make it illegal that you don't, you know, take medication? And that's going to be very hard to police. And we know with psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, the symptoms can be quite um, focused in a what we call a period of psychosis. So, so that can be days or weeks uh, where you have those delusions and paranoia. But, but people can go for months, if not years, without symptoms. And so in those periods, there is a danger that they will start feeling better and they will stop taking medication. Now, that is more of the question, and I, and I understand the public's need to want to kind of see the the chink in the system to say, aha, here it is, and if we mm. fix that, Bondi won't happen again. But, you know, uh, presumably this person, like many others, does, did not appear presenting with someone making threats that they were going to kill people. Otherwise, that would have been a very clear reason to detain them and, and hold them against their will. But um, when they don't do that and they're feeling OK, they they have a legal right to go off medication. It's it's not what's advised, but we can't force someone into treatment. And, and therein lies probably the bigger question and the problem. Now, before you go, um, I want to ask you about marijuana use and... Uh serious psychological conditions because there is a global trend uh, in the West to decriminalise marijuana for pers personal use. But is that risking these psychiatric disorders uh, becoming considerably worse and people suffering psychotic breaks? Uh, potentially, yes. So we know that the well, I understand the argument to decriminalising cannabis use uh, is to make it more open, potentially safer use of it, um, and of course reducing, you know, the backlog in, in legal repercussions. But yes, we know that there's such thing as called, you know, cannabis-induced psychosis, uh, um, and that's characterised by symptoms of uh, mm -hmm. paranoia, it's very much like schizophrenia, and we know. We've known for a very long time that there's evidence suggesting that ongoing use of cannabis is going to exacerbate any individuals who have some type of vulnerability to mental health already. So, yes, cannabis use can absolutely induce um, psychiatric episodes, psychiatric disorders. So if we are going to make this argument that it needs to be decriminalised, we absolutely need to have the conversation. Well, uh, does the public health system now need a whole heap of more money to be enhanced to do with potentially yes. an increase in cannabis-induced psychiatric conditions? Yeah, and I don't see that conversation happening at the moment. No, we're not seeing that conversation at all. Claire Rowe, thank you so much for your insights this evening. Thanks, Rita.